Hi everyone and welcome to part three of our Omega MSX2 build and it's been a real journey on this one so far. I've learned a lot and although we're not quite done yet we have made some huge progress and I hope you're excited to see where we're up to. If you recall where we left it last time we'd spent hours and hours soldering it all together, flashing ROM chips, checking voltages and signals and we currently have a very time consuming and not altogether cheap doorstop. So let's see if we can figure out what's going wrong. Here at the shack, we'd like to give a big thanks to the sponsor of this video, my good friends at PCBWay. They'll be helping us out with our PCB fabrication needs and offer a very professional and high quality service for extremely reasonable prices. They can even populate your PCBs for you if you're tired of waving a hot iron around. There's a link to their website in the description where you can check out all of the amazing services they offer. Now back to the show. So the situation we have is that we're all plugged in, definitely have power to the machine, the light on the keyboard is lit up, but we have no signal showing on the screen. So let's get the obvious things out of the way first and check that the composite cable and the TV are working by hooking up our Toshiba HX10 and seeing if we get a signal there. And we do. So we know the TV and the cable are okay. Right, let's be systematic about this and check things in order. I've got to send out a big thanks to Geordie Solis from MSX Makers because even though he doesn't know it, his documented build and test process was really helpful and even though it didn't point me directly to the actual issue, it was a really interesting read and I loved his progressive set of smoke tests, which will follow as part of our fault finding. First of all, I want to be checking whether all of the chips on the board are receiving the correct voltages because, well, it would be bad if they weren't. I followed Geordie's voltage map which was really helpful and everything seemed to check out just fine. So let's strip the board down to the essential chips and start progressively testing until we get to a working machine. To help with the first stage of this, Geordie had for download a Holt BIOS ROM set which contains two configurations, one that starts the Z80 in Holt mode which stops the CPU and one which contains a basic CBIOS NTSC ROM. It doesn't matter at this point that we've configured the machine as PAL because we haven't got all of the video circuitry in place anyway. All we're looking to do here is to see that if we boot the machine with the Holt BIOS loaded, with the jumper at J1 removed, then we should be reading 0 volts at pin 18 on the Z80, which we are. And then if we power down, pop the jumper in J1 to select the CBIOS NTSC ROM, or indeed any ROM image which isn't halting the CPU, and then power up, we should be getting around 5 volts at pin 18, and we're not. This could mean that we have a dead Z80, and I didn't have a spare one lying around. Several days later. So the new Z80 arrived, let's pop it in and try again. And yes, we now have 5 volts on pin 18. So why is this a big deal? Well, it means that the Z80 is running a program, albeit only with one instruction, to stop and not run anymore. However, this does mean that the CPU has access to the correct clock signal and can access and read the ROM and can run commands, which is very good news. Right, we'll leave that CBIOS NTSC ROM in place, but pop in the additional chips required to support video out and memory. Okay, let's turn on the screen and well, we're still getting a no signal, which is a little frustrating. So let's trace back through the video circuitry and see if we can spot the issue. Well, the CXA1645P is responsible for RGB encoding and also passing on the composite signal. I can't test the RGB output as the only MSX2 that I have is a Philips NMS VG8245, which is a SCAR output on the back. So let's pop in this spare CXA1645P and see if we get a different story. And unfortunately not. Right, let's go a bit further in tracing the circuit back to the VDP. And while checking all of the connections and components, I found two things. Firstly, I had two incorrect resistors. They should have been 220k ohms, but were in fact 
130k so I replaced those and at the same time I reflowed all of the solder joints along the way from the VDP to the CXA 1645P and the result of that is not exactly much to look at but at least it's not no signal. Okay, so the reason we just have random stuff on the screen at the moment is that there's currently no video RAM to store a video display into. So let's add in the 128K of VRAM and try again. Well, an error message is usually not a good thing, but we should be very happy at this point, as this means that our video circuit is working as expected, albeit in black and white at the moment. And the reason for that is because we have an NTSC BIOS running and we haven't got the circuitry in place for PAL encoding. So let's worry about that in a bit. For now, let's pop in all of the circuitry required for memory management and see if we get any further. Well, again, this is a step in the right direction. We can see the machine booting up and running this little program stored in the ROM, again, demonstrating that things are working. Right, I'm gonna go for it. I'm flashing a PAL ROM plugging in the keyboard and popping in the chip to allow PAL output. And look at that, a color MSX logo. Never has a sweeter thing appeared on a screen. Let's pop in the programmable sound generator or sound chip, in this case the AY38910 and its supporting chips and see whether we have any working sound. And to check this, we can type the basic command play followed by some notes in quotes. G, G, A, B, C, D. Oh dear, well, I was expecting something out of that. Now, if you recall, I did initially build this with a job lot of components that I grabbed off a seller on eBay. Well, this proved to be false economy as many of the chips were alternates to that stated on the board. I therefore put in an order with Mauser for all of the correct chips. And incidentally, the only ones I couldn't get were these three here which are the logic chips to support the sound chip. Several days later. Well, swapping those out did no good either. So I'm faced with the fact that it may just be a bad AY38910 chip. However, the good news is that the YM2149 sound generator is a Yamaha branded version of the AY38910. And as it happens, the YM2149 was fitted to the Atari ST. And I have a few spare ones of those lying around. Let's grab one of those, pop it in and see if it works. Play quote CDE and yes, we have sound. Now, unfortunately, my MSX SD mapper cartridge is still winging its way to me from Brazil, so I'm not able to test the cartridge slot at this point, but I can pop the few remaining chips on the board and then test the cassette and joystick ports. For this, I'm going to be using the SVI CAS that I reviewed last year as my virtual cassette system, and I'll plug in a joystick and we can test that too. So we'll just wait for this to load. And that all seems to work too. Quick game. Yep, all working. I'm a very happy bunny. So apart from the cartridge slots and the printer port, which will need a further episode, it all seems to be working. So let's pop it into its case because I'm excited to see it. If you recall, I asked you guys what color I should choose and over 800 of you voted and metallic gray came out on top with cherry red a close second. So I hope you like what I've come up with here. Yes, as it was so close, I've put cherry red on the bottom of the case and very nice it looks too. Don't worry about the inside. You won't see that of course when it's all put together.
you'll be happy to see that I've removed those temporary wood screws and replaced them with some proper ones. And there's our main board all nice and snug and secure in its new case. We've painted the cartridge slot guides the same cherry red as you can see that from outside the case when it's all put together and I didn't want a glaring white piece just sticking out. Quickly fix the keyboard in and then it's time for the crowning glory. For those of you that are interested, this is the same colour as the Philips NMS VG8245. I know, I looked it up, it's from Renault. Personally, I think this looks really good. And of course, we're not going to leave it there because there are lots of extra things we can do with this machine. Firstly, there's space down here for a GoTech drive. As standard, the Omega MSX doesn't have a drive controller, so we'll be building and integrating this TDC600 floppy interface at some point also, and I plan to see exactly how far we can push this machine. I want to do something a bit more special with these cartridge covers at some point, perhaps have spring-loaded metal ones, we'll see. Anyway, the next episode in this series will be in a few weeks time as I have to wait for my package from Brazil and I have another few videos I need to get finished too. Can't all be in my section, you know? Thanks for watching and I hope you've enjoyed the project update. If you like the video, please subscribe to the channel and hit the bell for notifications of new content. Please leave your comments below as we always love to read them. If you've got anything you'd like to donate to the shack and see featured on the channel, please drop us an email. If you'd like to support us, there are links in the banner on the main channel page and until next time in the Retro Shack, it's goodbye from me.